Good evening, everyone. My name's Richard Perkins, and welcome to tonight's public lecture entitled A, Wo a World of Food in Change. And uh, welcome to our speaker, uh, Michael Latour from IKEA. Um, before I introduce our speaker and say a few words about um, the background to today's talk, I just want to go through the order of proceedings tonight. Um, I'm going to just say a few words in a minute, and then Michael's going to give a lecture um, talking about uh, various aspects of the IKEA food journey in regards to sustainability and health. Um, then we're going to open it up to questions and answers, so we very much look forward to uh, a, a sort of vibrant question and answer session. And just towards the end, before we end, I'm going to invite Rob Clapp from the LSE Student Union Food Cycle Society to say a bit about, more about what they do and how you can contribute towards sustainability in food. Um, we plan to wrap up tonight at about 7.55. Just to let you know, this session is being recorded, it is being videoed, and we hope to make a podcast of it available to you at a later date. Uh, there's a Twitter hashtag, whatever that is, um, which, is which is hashtag LSE IKEA. Um, and can I just ask everyone to switch their mobile phones onto silent? Um, so, on to our speaker. Our speaker this evening is Michael Lacour, who's currently Managing Director of IKEA Food Services. For many of you, IKEA will be synonymous with flat pack furniture. Some of you would have spent hours of your time assembling this stuff uh, at various stages in your life. And indeed, when I was, when I was collating these, lecture, these notes, these introductory notes, I found myself surrounded by IKEA furniture, flat pack furniture. Um, so I found myself in my Beckham corner desk, next to my sort of, or sitting on my Marcus swivel chair, nestled in between my mom drawer desk and the ubiquitous Billy bookcase. Um, so IKEA is very, very big in furniture. But also IKEA is very, very big in food. Um, and this will be the subject of tonight's public lecture about IKEA's engagement with the food system and what it's doing in regards to sustainability and, and health in this food system. Um, so what Michael's going to be talking about is, is reflecting on the, res the responsibility, the role and responsibility of corporations in this food system in regard to health and sustainability, and discussing how these critical topics can drive innovation in the company. I'll say a few words about Michael. Um, I, 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 I hope he doesn't remember me saying, but I, I'm sure he'll he, he probably describe himself as a kind of mid-term veteran in IKEA. He's been in the business for about 20 years in various different parts of, of IKEA. But since 2013, he's been leading up IKEA food services. And a key thing Michael's been doing over the past few years is really engaging with the health agenda and the sustainability agenda. Uh, and this comes from a key value proposition within IKEA of recognizing these issues are core to IKEA's functioning. Um, now, IKEA um, uh, is, is also a company which has a wider eco-business strategy, people and the planet, and it sits within this strategy, I, um, Michael's work. Michael is no stranger to LSE because his daughter is actually studying here in international relations at the moment. Uh, so Emily, wherever you are, thank you very much for persuading Dad to come this evening. Uh, we're really excited to, to have your dad here to talk about these issues. So thank you very much, Michael, for coming this evening, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not even sure she's here, actually. I would okay. guess she's not. Um, and, and thank you so much for inviting us. Um, and when I say us, it's myself. And we have the whole food management group uh, with me as well. Because this is a uh, unique opportunity, really, for us to uh, come and, and meet people that have the same interest within food, sustainability, and health. And it's, it's only together that we will change and take on the challenges that we have. Now, I had a uh, presentation in mind uh, when I came over here um, in, during the, the, uh, the weekend. Um, but I think it would be a little bit strange for me to now just do a presentation without also just giving a, a sort of recognition to an event that is very important to IKEA. Uh, this Friday, our founder passed away, Ingvar Kamprat, and I'll talk about him. Uh, because a lot of our values, a lot of the culture that we have in the company is directly connected uh, with Ingvar. And in particular, when we talk about the food business, uh, that was very, very close to his heart, all the way up till the end. 
So we have a lot to thank him for, and um, he has supported this. Um, he uh, was a great entrepreneur on the furniture side, for sure, and we're known for that. Uh, but he also understood, and I'll show you this a little bit later, the importance of food, whether it was back in the 50s, but also today. And he was a great supporter of this new direction as well. So he understood the change that had happened over the past 10 years, which is dramatic from when we started with food. Um, I used to, in order to really put the food business, sometimes you need to do a little bit extra to get attention in a furniture company, to say that I hope one day all of you will say that IKEA is a great place to eat, and by the way, they sell some furniture. Um, and he loved that saying. He thought it was great. Let's work on that. And uh, the best we can do is actually to keep working on that. So we'll try to do our best. But I think it is appropriate to start with the beginning. Uh, and this is really where it all began. Uh, it began in Elmhultz. Uh, it's a small town in the middle of Sweden or southern Sweden. Um, this is where Ingvar was born in 1926. And he started up uh, as a 17 year old as an entrepreneur. IKEA started out selling ball pens and uh, all kinds of small things, matches. Um, but with time, of course, the concept developed. But from the beginning, it was driven by him. It was driven by his vision. And still today, that vision is what actually uh, shapes our company. The values and the cultures is actually referable and almost tangible when you visit in this area even for us who lead the company today. And uh, the ambition or vision he had was quite simple, yet quite complex to do. It is to create a better everyday life for the many people. This is 70 years old, but still today what we guide by. The vision influences everything we do, the products we develop, the ideas we share, the raw materials that we use, and not least also the prices that we sell at because to create a better everyday life for the many people around the world, whether you are in the UK, China, India, or wherever we're gonna to expand to, prices actually play a rather significant role and we'll come back to that. So with that vision, our heritage has developed also a strong culture and a, I would say we are a value-based company and that links further on into why and how we work with sustainability and health. It is a culture and value-driven organization, and uh, it's the heart of the mind of how we are. We often refer to it simply as the way we do things or the IKEA way. Um, and I think it's very visible in, in how we do things. Um, it's the DNA of everything we do. The eight values that we have are togetherness. We believe in working in teams. We believe in working with partners. We believe in working in a very flat organizational structure that we have. We believe in simplicity in the way that we act, the way we travel, in everything we do. Even in our design, you will see simplicity in the furniture sides as well. Caring for people and the planet has been a value in IKEA for many, many years, and is something that we live by in our entire value chain. Give and take responsibility, renew and improve, lead by example, being cost conscious. There's no IKEA co-worker that travels other than economy when we travel around the world as an example and being different, but always with a meaning, trying to find new ways. And this culture and the values and our vision has really served us quite well. The first 30 years of our existence, the concept development and the vision was kind of created, refined, the business idea was tested primarily in Sweden and Scandinavia. The next phase two, the expansion, we started trying out in Europe, North America, and we kind of also saw that with that expansion, we started lacking structure. We were very entrepreneurial, we did as we thought of it, and, and we came into phase number three, which was transformation. One, IKEA, we had a direction, and we started also expanding into Asia, Japan, Russia, and into Middle East. And we're now standing in front of a new era. We hope that it's not a fall from this top part, but actually will continue growing. The new era is signified by a digital revolution, very different retail behavior. We have 300, or th sorry, 3 billion people moving out of poverty by 2050. And as I said, we're going into new markets like India, South America, and Africa. 
where we have not had any experience so far. And we as people have impacted the planet so that we have climate challenges and resource scarcity and these are real and they're tangible threats. So we are actually in uh, a transformation phase uh, as the next thing. Now we have a good base to work from. IKEA has been remained uh, successful. We are close now to 200,000 employees and 1 billion store visits. That means we have a very wide reach in everywhere we go. And that's, of course, a great opportunity. Now, as it was said earlier, we're probably mostly known from our furniture side. But in fact, when you ask customers on the street, what do you connect the IKEA brand with? Very often, it's the meatball that comes up as the first thing. <laughs> that, of course, is no coincidence. And it was a simple proposition. Um, Ingvar told me the story of asking him, why, why would you figure out a restaurant? The first ones opened in the early 50s. The store you see behind is the first store in Elmholt in the city that was opened. And at that time, there was not a lot of people in Elmholt at all, other than him and his family, I believe. And they had to bus customers in from around Sweden and probably even from Denmark. And they were all ready to sell furniture. But the first question that the customers came with, where is the coffee? Can I get cakes? And just as simple as that, it became the uh, food concept as we uh, know it today. Today we have about 403 restaurants. The first one opened in 59. We have what we call bistros, which is more uh, sort of fast food. Uh, the IKEA hot dog, I think, is, is quite known uh, to many people. Uh, we have what we call Swedish food markets, where we export uh, Swedish foods uh, too throughout the world and then in that process have become one of the biggest exporter of Swedish food. We have 18,000 uh, co-workers today and we sell for one or two billion euro on a yearly basis. And these restaurants are uh, quite big. Uh, an average size of a restaurant is about 450 seats and the new restaurants we open in Asia and in India where we're going to open is up to a thousand seats. So per definition we will always be the biggest Swedish restaurant in any city we are opening in, which is a, a great, <laughs> great thing. And as I said, we're known by these things, the, bill, the, the meatballs. One billion meatballs and a little in addition. I'll come back to why that is a blessing, but also a responsibility to take. Food actually means that 20% come to the IKEA brand just for the food. But apart from the sales, the most important thing for us is really that we have 660 million visitors on a yearly basis. That means that every Londoner would have to eat at an IKEA restaurant 70 times per year. Think about that. Isn't that a great thought? <laughs> I think it is. But, you know, we are extremely uh, blessed to having this flow of customers, obviously. Um, and it's building on the concept that is sort of created up through the 80s. It is a range that has a very distinct Swedish uh, profile, but then we try to adapt in every country that we're in. Korea, we have kimchi, and in any other countries <coughs> there will be different things. So, in many ways, we could have continued our journey and uh, selling food. But, sometimes it takes a scandal to actually uh, wake up and do something different. And for us, that scandal was the horse meat scandal, which occurred in 2013. I actually believe it started in, in, in Holland and really became public here in the UK, uh, if I'm uh, remembering correctly. And IKEA got involved in this as well not being able to uh, ensure a supply chain did not have at that uh, time horse meat in, uh, in the minced meat. And it was a shock for us um, to understand that this was going on. It disclosed a business that needed serious revision and a clear makeover. The topic created just for us more than 15,000 articles in around uh, 80 countries and reaching more than 940 million people in a negative way. Um, and we, of course, had to take inventory on how this could happen and how we could uh, prevent this going forward. 
looking in hindsight, I think it's the best thing that has ever happened to us. Because it was the catalyst, not just to take back control of what we're doing throughout our own supply chain, but also to be proactive about what we wanted to do going forward. And as I said, or should have said in the beginning, I'm not really here to do a lecture, because I don't think we can lecture anybody. I'm going to tell you the story on what we did and how we took this on. So with this as the catalyst of change, we simply had to stop taking inventory and start looking into the future. What do we want to do with our food business? We reflected on our position, um, where we were at that time, and we even asked ourselves the question, should IKEA even be in the food business? Are we even equipped for the food world as it is today? So what we did was we gathered 84 people precisely in a joint venture in Copenhagen in the spring of 2014 to discuss the future of IKEA food. Uh, we had our own people to a certain extent, but we also had customers, co-workers, uh, suppliers, NGOs, uh, leading food experts, and, and food companies like Yellow Cottage, Jamie Oliver Industries were there to help us. And together to take an inventory on where is the food industry really today and what can we as a player in the food industry do. I think a lot of us that, that are here today in the audience that uh, we were there and, and it was a very, very interesting couple of three days. Um, we've always thought of ourselves in IKEA as a small company. You know, it's a small city in Elmhult and food, we're not that big because we're small within IKEA but it's still 2 billion euro. And with 660 million is really the, the key thing here. And, and what changed, I think, our, our mindset a lot was that one of these renowned experts that had been in the food business for many, many years stood up and said, are you aware of the responsibility you have? And do you understand that you can have a greater impact on public health with the reach of 660 million people than any government has actually succeeded in doing? And I think that was a mind-provoking uh, thing for all of us to kind of understand because we had not really thought in those terms before. So we do see 660 million as a great opportunity, but I would say an even greater responsibility. Now, luckily, IKEA has since 2012 developed a standpoint on what responsibility means. People Planet Positive that was mentioned, we started working with in that time frame in IKEA. And with responsibility, we mean that we want to have a positive impact on people and the planet. And for us, it's about balancing economic growth and positive social impact with environmental protection and regeneration. And the more people we reach, the bigger the impact we can have. And then people can actually, if we go back to the, um, the vision of a better life for the many people. And we do that through the People Planet Positive uh, direction. This is the IKEA Sustainability Strategy, and it was launched, as I said, in 2012 with ambitious goals to transform uh, the IKEA business. The purpose of the strategy is to inspire, activate, and lead us in our decision-making and goal-setting so that we together can achieve the big positive changes we want to see in the world and for the entire IKEA ecosystem. The strategy gives us a roadmap to follow and outline a strong common long-term agenda for the entire value chain and our franchise system. And through our business, we have a unique opportunity to lead the way by being a good example for positive change in society. It builds, as I think many uh, strategies do, on the uh, sustainable development goals. Our sustainability ambitions and commitments are set for 2030 in line with these UN sustainability goals. The goals and the challenges were launched by UN in 15 and referred to as SDGs, provide inspiring framework for collective action, guides and develops our business and the guides also our engagement with our partners and suppliers. All goals connect to IKEA and is a camp compass for how we work. Now, we can do our part, but we probably can't really save the entire world. So we've honed in on the areas that we really believe that we should do something extra in. And when it comes to food specifically, particularly number 12, responsible consumption and production is a very important uh, goal that I'll come back to when it comes to food waste and what we can do there and must do there in, in that same thing. When it comes to 14, uh, life below water, 
we have actually transferred all of our seafood offer to being ASC, MSC certified uh, food, so coming from sustainable fisheries. When it comes to 17 partnership for the goals, IKEA has in general signed up to the We Mean Business Coalition about climate change, RE100 coalition, which is about 100% renewable energy, and just I guess a couple of months ago, we signed up to the Cerrado Manifesto to, have to really halt the deforestation connected to soy and beef production in the Amazon. So we can and we will play an active role in many of these things. And when it comes to climate change, we have a clear point of view in IKEA in general. And then, of course, that has a clear also positive effect when it comes to the food business. We believe that climate change is no longer a distant threat, but a visible reality. And we believe that climate change is one of the biggest challenges that humanity faces. We will try to enable people to actively live a healthier and more sustainable life at home with a focus on the efficiency and functions of the home, offering more than 500 different and hopefully also very affordable products and solutions for water efficiency, energy efficiency, and so on. Today, we own 327 windmills. We regenerate 71% of our power usage in the stores through 730,000 solar panels on all of our buildings. And to the right, you can see LED bulbs. Today, we only sell LED bulbs. Uh, and we sell about 80 million LED bulbs. And that saves energy that could actually um, light up 650,000 homes. So we have done a lot of steps when it comes to the furniture side. But then how would we actually translate that to food? And here's the journey then we started sort of uh, in, in immediately after the, the horse meat scandal. Now, what we call it is a better food for people and planet. We want to inspire and actually also um, motivate for more sustainable eating and lifestyles. As mentioned, there's been a clear shift towards food culture and customers to demand healthy and more sustainable food. This we see in markets like, for sure, UK, London is a great area, but actually throughout the whole world. Health and sustainability plays a part, whether it is in China, in, in Europe, or North America. So we have a great opportunity to inspire our customers to a healthier and more sustainable food offer. Uh, but that involves making better products. Uh, so we have really tried to transfer all of our resources and all of our energy to developing delicious, affordable, healthy, and sustainable food. And that's what we do from a, a centralized uh, product development perspective. And our ambition is to create a range that makes sustainable and healthy eating easy and affordable for the many. Too often, healthy and affordable solutions come at premium price points and is not accessible for the many people. But being true to our vision, that is where we will actually have to focus and do our part. And I'll give you some example on what we've done there. And to create a range and an experience that brings families and children together and fosters a positive relationship with food. But in order to get to these uh, ambitions, which are high ambitions, we also had to, of course, take a look at uh, the food system that we're working within. And uh, particularly for this audience, I don't think I need to go into details what's wrong with the, the food system. But I think it's interesting to see that the food industry that we have created today and the challenges we are facing really are created by ourselves. They're created in our hunt for more sales, lower prices, and very often a lack of insights of the consequences from a production perspective, and for example, also the nutritional values. It's not a sustainable, it's not a long-term way of working. Food production has a huge impact on climate change. Latest numbers show that 28 to 30 percent of all glasshouse um, emissions in the EU come from the food industry. And it's also directly connected to food prices. And according to Oxfam, which this is from, um, stable food uh, prices could be more than doubled by 2030. We waste every third of the calories produced at the same time as one in seven people go to bed hungry in the entire world. I just saw the newspaper this morning in the hotel, which had also then 
the front page that UK was hitting the number one spot in the EU in terms of obesity. Could just as well have been any other EU country, but it said 24.5% of people in the UK are uh, to be described as uh, obesity or in that framework. With all the related illness, illnesses that leads to and the cost for society that in long term also will do both economically and human cost. And I would assume most here has Netflix accounts. You've seen all the movies that are coming out around a sick food system, food fraud, and we've had a long string of food-related scandals lately. This year, or within a year, we've looked at uh, the fipronil eggs scandal and tainted Brazilian meat, as just to say some of them. So this is a system that needs to be addressed and where companies like IKEA needs to play a role. Uh, and I'll show what we can do and in combination with other entities as well. Our take on this is then linked very much to the People Planet Positive. We have three main areas. We're talking about health and sustainable living, circular and climate positive, and a fair and equal society. We have sort of tried to have a holistic approach along the length of the entire value chain from the farms to the products to the products that you actually choose to consume. When we talk about healthy and sustainable living, we mean a range that inspires healthier choices like plant-based, less hidden sugar and more balanced meals from a nutritional perspective. And when we talk about climate and um, circular positivity, I will come back to some of the exact uh, programs that we're doing in the next couple of slides. And a fair and equal society means that we also engage ourselves all the way backwards in the supply chain. We have something called I-Way, the IKEA way, which is the IKEA standard for labor practices in the supply chain. And we will also engage ourselves with social entrepreneurship, with suppliers that are not normally big enough for a large supply chain, but deserves attention and that we should also take. And with that, we've also decided that we want to take leadership. One of the outcomes from our future search was really that we don't want to just follow the norm. We want to try to take lead. We might not be in the best positions to always do that, but we will have the ambition. And in order to do that, we've developed this sort of guideline. We believe that through our business, we can support and influence positive change. And uh, through our business, we have a unique opportunity to lead the way by being a good example for change. Now, being a leader means to look critically at all aspects of our business, but also to engage in the debate, which is one of the reasons why we're here today, and enabling customers, co-workers, and partners to take action and actually contribute. We also believe that we should set transformational goals, and we'll give you a couple of examples of that. And most importantly, actual proof points to sustain the journey. And in our case, the proof points are very often products uh, that you can actually see as examples of moving the agenda in the right um, direction. And the way that we do it, we always talk about the entire value chain in IKEA. We, this is referred to very often as the IKEA diamond. And what it really illustrates is that we can develop products, but we have a whole value chain to look into. And in order to reach the right price points, there is a corporation that is necessary from the base with all of our suppliers and all the way up. That means that very often you have to find the right partners to work with, suppliers that have the same ambitions, that have the same values to a certain extent, and that you can develop and work with in long-term uh, aspects. Also throughout here, we need to set the um, ambitions in a clear way, and we need to actually, in this context, uh, focus on our transformational goals. One example is that we've committed to do our part in meeting the Paris Agreement on keeping the uh, temperature below the two degrees. And uh, that actually means uh, an emission of minus 15% by uh, 2030. When you look at the range we have today, this will have an immense impact. How are we going to do that? I, we don't have the answers on yet, but we are aware that we need to do something. And this is where we believe that uh, innovation and thinking new is the only way forward. 
We will have sustainable livestock production by 2025. And we want the majority of our range to be healthy, whatever that means, which it is not today. Now, in order to define what healthy is, we've uh, had a, um, put together a health board with leading experts from universities around the world, Nottingham University and Harvard University, to mention a few, that are experts within obesity, food, to guide us in what is healthy food really and how can we push that agenda in a positive way and how do we explain to customers that this is a better choice as well. Now, based on, on that, of course, there's a movement, but there also needs to be the proof points. And for us, being uh, IKEA developing range, we actually have a very simple guideline. This is the guideline that is valid for everything we do also on the furniture side. Uh, democratic design uh, is what inspires us in our product development in all ways. Function is food that is inspired by Scandinavian tradition that makes you feel good and everyday life better. Form is about beautiful and appetizing and stimulating all senses. Quality, food you can trust and that's good for you. Sustainable is about responsible food that is people, animal and plant positive. And then I think very important, low price to make it truly affordable for the many people. This is where we have one of our absolute biggest challenges. One of Ingvar's sayings was always, it's super easy to design something very expensive. It's very difficult to make something that looks expensive, but actually make it very affordable for the many. Because we believe that no method really is more effective than the good example. It is only when we make it come alive in front of you, in front of ourselves, that we see that we're making progress in the challenges that we have. And sometimes you can say, you know, you're not the biggest food company in the world, and we're not. But even small changes can have a major impact. When you put it up towards the fact that we have 660 million people that eat with us, and even more that visit IKEA, we have a great opportunity to actually influence behavior, choices, and to um, make a long-lasting example. But you can't do it with only PowerPoints and with speeches and web pages that informs. You have to do it with something that's tangible and that's desirable for the majority. So one of the examples that we did as the first step was actually to challenge our own position. We're known for the meatballs. I think conventional <coughs> thinking would be, let's not touch that, let's not jeopardize that. But we actually decided to do exactly that, to develop a veggie ball that has a carbon footprint that's 30 times less <coughs> that of a meatball, and introduce that to the customers. And we also priced the veggie balls at a lower price point than the meatballs, and today they are actually price leading. And we believe that is the way forward. Innovation and to uh, tackle the uh, challenge that we have is not so much about taking things out. There might be things that should be taken out because it's absolutely um, off the charts. But other than that, it is about offering better um, opportunities and propositions. And the meatball today stands for around, has taken up to 10, 11% of that sales that we have in all of our stores today. We also just decided to quite quickly uh, on actually recommendation from our health board to tackle the topic on hidden sugar. So in all of the stores there are drink towers and we developed as the first uh, product, uh, a product where we took out, uh, created a very clearly Nordic profile and we took down the sugar content with about 50%. And there's a lot of other products that we have introduced lately, oat-based smoothies, Nordic grain products, and a countless amount of examples in our 49 markets that are working along the same way. We've also decided to really hone in and see what we can do when it comes to food waste. Uh, food waste is a, I think, not known enough topic uh, to us, maybe uh, amateurish, but 
was new to us in 2014 when we met with the people from the food industry. One third of all food harvested in the world today is wasted. It gets lost in the field. It gets lost in our requirements, retailers' requirements. It gets lost in transportation, further processing, and actually in our own home. It's the third biggest greenhouse gas emitter if it was a country on its own. We have decided that this is an area where we can do something in short term. So we have created an initiative that's called Food is Precious. And this aims to cut food waste in the food operations by 50% by uh, fiscal year 2020. Here we actually have tried to make a transformational goal by taking 10 years off the UN SDG goals. And surveys show that it's a very achievable thing. This is in our restaurants themselves. Um, and not only have we taken down the food waste in the restaurants, the very positive effect is, as I mentioned earlier, 18,500 employees are now talking about food waste. And 50% of them say that they have now actually changed behavior in their daily life just by being more alert on what food waste is and the things that we can do. And imagine us working now across from just food but into our furniture range as well. Storage facilities, appliances that can actually combat this. This is an area where I believe IKEA will take lead and not only will we do it internally, uh, we have also committed together with the World Resource Institute to be part of the Champions 12.3 initiative under the UN. And we are also represented in, uh, in the steering group under the Danish government uh, on how we can work with this on a global perspective. Apart from that, we uh, go even further back in the supply chain and these uh, better programs have just been launched, so they're very fresh. But what we actually uh, look for here and what we want to uh, focus on here is how we can take a greater responsibility in the entire supply chain. We've developed these better programs to address and focus ambitions on more sustainable agriculture for all the major animals that we have in our supply chain. This is not just important for animals, in fact. Um, human health is connected to 60% of emerging human diseases, including pandemic influenza, and they all originate from animals. These better programs are global. They are developed with input from experts, NGOs, and suppliers, and set our minimum requirements for sourcing. The aim is to work towards sourcing all of our species, chickens, laying hens, pigs, salmon, beef, and dairy cattle, to keep, be compliant by 2025. And what it means is basically just a better life for the animals as well. It's about light, it's about space, it's about the behavioral needs that animals have as well. And as we said, there is a clear link to the human health and the environment as well as before mentioned. This really relates to the, you could say, the more traditional supply chain that we have, but we also are engaging ourselves with social entrepreneurship so engaging ourselves with supplier that would not normally be of a size that would be applicable for our supply chain. And we try to work in different ways. IKEA has done this on the furniture side for quite some years. And since a year ago, we started also on the food side. We have one project out of 17 uh, that we work with. On the furniture side, we're doing partnerships with social entrepreneurs in countries like India, Thailand, Sweden, Jordan, Romania and the US. And we have just launched this coffee uh, from Uganda, uh, which is traditionally uh, farmed in uh, Uganda, which is normally a men's business, but around 50% of the works on farms is performed by women. Women who often have limited access to financial resources or lack farming skills. And the corporation White Nile is the ones we work with that work with building these skills and making these women independent and also long-term suppliers, hopefully, for ourselves. And what's interesting for us out of this is that 8,000 individuals get touched by this, and that's the whole purpose with the social entrepreneurship. So when we move into the food supply chains here, be it coffee, cocoa, and other things that we will start looking into, it will have a positive effect on a very high number of people. And we believe a high number of people, both is what we have to take care of in the supply chain, but it's certainly also what we expect coming to the stores. 660 million will grow to a billion. Uh, we are 
expanding into new markets. And we're also seeing a very different environment and very different um, customer base coming towards us. And I think a lot of the faces I look at right now will subscribe to this. Food has changed at the same context. Food is a very social thing today. Um, the biggest social revolution, I guess, in my time at least, is probably the digital revolution. The fact that we're all connected on our phones, smartphones, and so on. And food seemingly has gained importance as being that sort of physical social thing that we meet around. Um, I myself know very well how it is. I mean, to get my daughters to come down, I usually have to text them, and then they'll show up for dinner. And that's a good, I think, illustration on, on how that interacts. We are taking pictures, Insta-worthy. I didn't know that word a couple years ago. Uh, that is a thing, apparently. Um, and hashtag food, hashtag IKEA food is the highest trending thing if we look into IKEA uh, as well. So food plays an enormously important role now than it probably did just five, ten years ago. And it actually also challenges how we are going to meet uh, customers in the future with food. What customers today expect, and for us, this is a quite simple thing. With 660 million just listening to your customers, it's quite easy to understand what they want. We don't need a whole lot of surveys. Uh, you know, we look at the customers we have, talk to the kids we have, and it's very simple. There is an expectation on healthy food, that we have a healthy offer, that you're very well aware of what you sell, what's the ingredients in food. Customers choose or choose not to, out from sustainability uh, concerns. This is something we didn't see five years ago. It's a digital age. Everybody wants to have access, and they want it now. And everybody wants, even if you have 660 million customers, to feel that you personally are being served. So this, for sure, changes everything that uh, we do. This puts a pressure on how we meet customers. It puts a pressure on our range. And we actually have to re-innovate and reinvent basically most things that we do. And the changes are significant. And our rules for change are the following five. We have to set short-term actionable goals. This is not a change that will happen three, four, five years. It's happening right now. We have to make friends in tech. We have to make friends with chefs, entrepreneurs that can help us, that can actually help us tap into new ways of thinking, new ideas. It's with help from friends in tech that we actually have managed to bring our food waste down in the stores. Simple tech, very easy to use, um, and, and the like. So in connection with our normal way of working, we have to have a way of working with all this. And there's an enormous amount of attention and money being thrown in with venture capital into the food business in these years. We have to engage, not least, with our co-workers, suppliers, and we have to change the mindsets from within. We firmly believe in the transformational power of our co-workers. We've seen it with the food waste. When they start believing in it, it really changes. And sometimes it's quite simple. My daughters, are vegetarians or flirting with veganism even. And that has changed our cooking at home, our way of eating. And it's the same throughout. Uh, and we firmly believe that we have a big job to do with our approximately 200,000 co-workers. Democratic design, as I showed it earlier, we believe that is a very good framework for all our product development. And we will not be afraid of tackling global challenges head on because there is simply no other way with the vision we have of creating a better everyday life for the many. One example of engaging with people on from the outside is this Space 10. It's a future living lab that we have in Copenhagen. It's uh, originally a rebel agency uh, and they have sort of free hands to work with all kinds of things. Um, they can embrace changes in society faster, they can ideate, they can test and try things that are a little crazier than we can do in the bigger machine. And failure here is absolutely okay. It's actually 
expected that we fail a whole lot of things. Otherwise, we're probably not daring enough. Some of the existing projects that are, we're working with here is the urban farm, uh, vertical, vertical uh, gardening. And lately, not from here, but we've also had a boot camp where we had uh, tests into alternative proteins, actually banana flies as an alternative protein. Very exciting. So we don't know if the crispy or the meatball looks like this next time you visit IKEA. Uh, I think there's a little, little ways to go still. Um, our learning was that uh, it's still in the early days when it comes to alternative proteins. But there's no doubt that even we, as the meatball connoisseurs we are, have to challenge how that future will look. And we have also come to the very clear uh, understanding that this is not something that we will do alone. We know we have to take the next steps with the many and for the many. The way to do it is to frame the challenges that we are facing in the food world as opportunities. And using that as fuel for innovation and discovery, how we can move forward. IKEA, uh, we don't have all the answers at all, uh, but we can promise that we will try and that we'll do our best, we'll listen to others. And a good old IKEA value is always to try and learn from your mistakes. And we're going to do a lot in the uh, coming years. We also know that we have to do it with other like-minded companies. And we're opening up for that. Politicians, governments, and influencers that are on the same topic, we need to support. We've seen that with the few engagements we already had with Champions 12.3, with the Danish government, that that's when we can actually move something. I don't believe we as a company can move it alone. I don't believe a government can move it alone. But coming together on the same things, we have a possibility to move it forward. And we have to do it together with you guys. We have to do it together with the young people with energy, drive, ideas that can inspire us and push our common conventions on how things are done. That is a very, very important component also of our success going forward and why it's so great to actually uh, be allowed to, to speak today. We are just basically responsible as a company. It's not a thing that had to come. It's been in the DNA of the company from the beginning. And we are, in fact, just, you know, not so much a company, but just human, humans that are inspired by the vision that Ingvar Kampat created seven, 70 years ago, and a culture that talks about thriftiness, that talks about doing the right things and being relevant for the many people wherever we're going to be. And because of that, it's very simple to see that the only responsible way forward for us and for coming generations is to take responsibility as much as we can. So, we know we have a lot to do, it's urgent, but we take solemn in the last words from Ingmar, when, which he's always said in every challenge he gave us, most things still remain to be done, and what a glorious future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, we now can open up for questions. Uh, there are microphones roving around the room. Um, so if you could wait till a microphone reaches you. Um, and can I just ask for short, punchy questions rather than statements, please? Um, because then we'll get the most out of uh, this evening's session. So I'll start with the uh, lady in the, um, I'm a bit colorblind, gray, I think it's gray, gray jumper there. Thank you for your talk. Uh, plastic packaging has been an intrinsic part of the food industry. And uh, how does IKEA seek to address the plastic problem, especially, you know, it's expanding into developing countries where solid waste is a, ma is a major concern, especially plastics? Yeah. Uh, it's one of those areas where we still do not have concrete um, plans on how to uh, address it. There is no doubt, however, that it is one of those topics where within a very short time we need to take a stand. I believe here in the UK we're uh, looking at legislation uh, around um, disposables and the like. Um, and it is one of the areas uh, when it comes to all sort of the disposables that we use throughout uh, our restaurants and so on that we're looking at. We do in fact have a project running on this, on how we will address it. 
And I have no doubt that when the results of this project comes, it will be, um, again, with the philosophy of taking lead, not following. Uh, it's, we are committed to a fully circular um, uh, approach. And that really, I don't think, leaves any space for the plastic that we have today in, in the food industry. Then we probably have a much bigger uh, challenge when it comes to all the plastic furniture uh, that we uh, at times have. But also there, we have innovation going on in how we can use recycled plastic and the like. The gentleman just in front here in the, in the, with the tie. Thanks. Um, I was really interested in the chart that you showed earlier about um, the things that are wrong with the food industry. And um, it's perfectly true that what you saw in the newspaper is true. 66% of people in this country are overweight, half of them dramatically. In the 49 countries in which you operate, I would say those are probably not untypical figures. And yet on your chart, you chose to mention hunger, yeah. not obesity. I was really surprised at that. Yeah. Uh, I could have had taken obesity as well. Um, hunger was the, uh, more related to the, the focus we have on, on food waste. The fact that uh, the, 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 the conflict in, in throwing so much food away and then at the same, same time having hunger. When it comes to obesity uh, and health, it is a, a major driver of uh, actually combining sustainability and health very closely together. Uh, when we started on this journey, the typical approach in, in most of the food companies we talked about was, would be to have a sustainability manager. We hired a sustainability and health manager because we do believe it's intertwined. And we do believe that we have a responsibility to actually, uh, you could say, combat or, 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 or uh, offer better offers so that we can do something about the obesity uh, topic we have. And you're quite right, um, the numbers are pretty much the same where we were throughout the world. And we believe we have a responsibility for that. Hidden sugar, uh, fats, the nutritional values of, of the food that we sell. And um, I think we face a great challenge in, in actually uh, finding a way where both, it's in, it's in essence not so difficult to do better products, but how do we actually nudge customers to take these choices? How do you uh, stimulate them. You can do it through price, but not only that, to actually, you know, take the choices that are better for you. How can we inspire to a kids menu that would do these things? Because when you ask kids, we found out they want French fries, pizza, and, and those sort of things. And it goes all the way down to that. So um, we have a, um, a great responsibility in, in that uh, direction, I would say, as well. Absolutely. Uh, the, um Lady there in the glasses, yeah. Thank you for the talk tonight. Thank you, Dr. Perkins, for your time as well. Um, I have a question around the farming. As, um, as you know, the climate change is going to affect different regions in different ways. And in some areas, greater, greater temperatures, greater rainfall helps. And in other areas, it doesn't, with the farmers specifically. I'm wondering, in areas like South Asia, where you're hoping to enter the market, um, Farmers are going to have issues with irrigation and you know, access to roads in rural areas. Does IKEA have any um, goals to sort of support them in that, in that area because of the responsibility you have as a firm? Or is that something you're going to look into in the future? Uh, it's something, as we're not there yet, uh, it's something we're going to look into. Um, I think one of the major challenges um, as we expand as a global company and with the volumes we have, which are not overwhelming, uh, is of course, how do we build up a sustainable supply chain? Uh, how big a part can you actually uh, export around the world? And how big a part would you have to do or produce in the local areas that we're in? Now, assuming that we will, or we will expand in, in Southeast Asia, uh, we're open up in the Philippines and Vietnam, I believe is, is one of the next ones we will actually start engaging into that supply chain. And what follows when IKEA engages or builds up a supply chain is what I mentioned earlier, um, a framework called IKEA way, the I way uh, norms. And, and um, that sets standards for what sort of production we would want. Um, on the specific questions, we could very often actually go backwards and invest in, in order to sort of set the best practice if it's not existing in a certain, in a certain country. 
So um, we don't have, uh, to my knowledge, uh, big production in, in, in that region. But when we go in, there will be a takes on that because it, it links into the people planet positive of, on how we will conduct business in, the, in these regions or anywhere in the world. Um, let's take some, some questions about that. There's, there's a, um, a gentleman right back there with, yep. Yeah. Hey, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, one of the biggest issues with agriculture is evidently the livestock sector, right? Uh, so one question I'd have for you is, what sort of, uh, to what extent IKEA is making the switch to, uh, is making people move towards plant-based diet a priority for IKEA? To what extent? And sort of what strategies is IKEA going to come up with to encourage people to have diets that focus more on plant-based eating rather than the consumption of meat products? Mm. We're tapping into a, a, a super good uh, issue that uh, we spent two days in London with here as a, as a management team. Um, it's 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 a uh, it's it's a bit of a um, I wouldn't say dilemma, but it, it's a great challenge, isn't it? Because the majority of the range that we have today is meat-based. We're known for our meatballs; people love it. And in the journey that we have, we have to ensure that we also have a sustainable business. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's difficult to lead uh, if you have nobody behind you. Um, it, the trick is kind of to lead in the pace where you still get the masses with you. And we've discussed there are kind of different ways to go. You can go the way of taking out a lot of the meat products and just replace them uh, with other things. But we've had a very tangible learning in, in Germany where we tried to actually just not even take away the, the meatballs, but supplement the fries with, with the vegetables. Uh, that was a short test, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> did not work. Uh, people are very emotional about their food. Uh, they do not want to be lectured. Um, so the, the way that we have chosen is that we will set goals, and we haven't agreed on them yet, uh, in terms of how big a share of our range we would like to have plant-based. Um, and the goal is sort of whatever we end up with is, is, is going to be fine. But already now we're looking into alternatives. We're looking into alternative meats. We are, uh, I can disclose that as well, we are working right now. Uh, apart from the meatball, we're known for our hot dogs. So that's one area if we can actually get 10% of the people that eat hot dogs onto vegetarian hot dogs. Um, we will do that, and that's a project that we're actually testing right now in Sweden. So uh, it is about innovation. It is about focusing into innovation, um, finding meat alternatives, um, having internal goals, and then I think a huge gray area for us, and I understand that this universe is actually uh, looking into that, so that could be interesting to continue talks around that, is how do you actually sort of do this nudging? How do you in communicate in a way where it becomes a natural choice for customers. We tried, as I said, to price our veggie meatballs or veggie balls um, lower than our meatballs. They are priced lower. But whether that's the reason for the success, I think, is, is, is a bit of a stretch. Um, but that would, of course, be one, one part. I think there's a lot around the communication and how we do that. And in the end, I think it's just that you create really delicious alternatives, really. You know, people don't want to feel that they're punished. I'll take a question for the lady here. Hi, I wanted to ask a question about eating at home. Um, I look back at the McKinsey report in the uh, spirit of money and economics, and they said that looking at obesity, portion control has one of the biggest wins on changing obesity. I wonder, looking at design um, in IKEA, has there been any change in design in terms of how we eat at home, what we eat off? Um, the portion distortion that we've seen in the food uh, retail and manufacture um, to has, well, I'm not suggesting IKEA has sort of aided that, but do you look at that as, as a factor at all at the moment, thinking about obesity? If, uh, sorry, I had a difficult here, but I think um, you asked about whether we, from a design perspective, have sort of a responsibility and, and, and plans to do something on the food side or food and furniture or at home. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, first and foremost, for sure, we have our share as well. Um, I think the best example is still actually the meatballs. When it started out with, uh, back in the day with Ingwood, it was eight pieces. Now the, the average top seller is about the 12 uh, piece portions um, that we have today. So, you know, that's, that's happened. Um, the realization around what, um, as I said, food waste, obesity, um, are not topics that we talked about in the furniture side till 2014. When we launched the new direction, that became a topic. And we have spent a lot of time, even internally in IKEA, to actually take these things up because there's a huge potential in what you point to there. Uh, I use the example now on, on food waste that we together with the kitchens department look at appliances. Can we be the leading in the world on appliances that actually can help you uh, take down food waste? Uh, today, food uh, put into refrigerators, really, refrigerators is where food goes to die, really. Um, can we together with uh, the other departments work with better and smarter storage units that could maybe prolong the time of uh, food you could keep? Now, a next natural step would be, as you point to, are there something about the, the, the pores, the sizes of, of, of plates, for instance, uh, even cups, cutlery, uh, and the like? Um, we haven't gotten there yet, but it is a, um, a thing that we are talking with that department. We actually have today internally uh, what we call the core air foods, so not only food, but also kitchens and all the utensils we're working together in aligning our, our strategies. So I would uh, be surprised if you won't see something in the, in the range in, in the future, for sure. Gentleman at the F, just behind. Thank you for the talk. My question is, how does IKEA food business transmit and implement their I direction across the supply chain? The uh, way that we work this is with very, very close partnerships. Um, IKEA has um, traditionally be built up from the furniture side on very close partnerships. Uh, we have a strong belief that there needs to be a uh, overlap in terms of culture and values in order to really have sustainable long-term relationships. And as such, it means that our partners, key suppliers, uh, key development suppliers, we usually refer to them to, are part of even develop our strategies. We had suppliers as part of the, the future search I mentioned earlier. And that gives us a very natural way of actually being very close contact, communicating and ensuring. Then, of course, you always have your checks and balances in terms of, of uh, auditing on different basic things. But it really has to be so that you have long-term partnerships. There is a natural overlap on values. And then it's very easy to transfer, the, transfer these ambitions. A lady there, and just behind her. Thanks. Hi. Um, I've got a question in relation to the horse meat scandal, and I'm hoping you can address it. I'm not sure. You mentioned the reputational impact that it's had, so 15,000 articles, 80 countries, etc. But I just wondered whether it translated at all into commercial impact, or can you give any indication whether actually you saw that people weren't buying the meatballs, or did people not care? <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's in, I wasn't really there at the moment, at the time. Uh, I came in the, in the summer after, and I, I would say that <laughs> The impact was tangible on the, on the organization. But from a customer perspective, we had some countries that managed not to be implicated. So of course it was just even. Um, but I do believe there was a, apart from a reputational, um, uh, we, we did of course lose uh, sales as well. It's a very big share of our sales. And uh, for not having meatballs for periods, weeks uh, on end, it does cost something. Uh, it wasn't, dramatic in the sense people would buy other things and, and, and you know I think there was a, a major understanding that it wasn't an IKEA specific thing it was a, a general thing so it, it, most other products caught up for it but I, I would say from a reputational perspective it, um, it's not something that um, we had expected and, and certainly not something we would like to be associated with either I think that was more the, uh, the impact really. Mm. The gentleman at the back um, uh, yes, you're in the centre, yeah. Uh, 
Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I just wonder, um, you didn't mention water. Um, and the, the land, the land, are you using synthetic fertilizers in the land? Jackie, now that we're into the technical things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do we have a second microphone or not? Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, who, who asked that question? Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Jackie. I'm Health and Sustainability. Um, so we do use fertilizers in some occasions. I guess we, what we try and do is use um, sustainable, more sustainable sure. um, certifications where we can, um, increasing the volume of raw materials that we buy under those certifications. And that involves organic certifications. Um, we use them a lot. Uh, we have coffee, for example, that's organic. Um, we're trying to get organic cocoa. We use it a lot with jams, with rapeseed oil, um, a number of different products. Um, so of course, we don't use any fertilizers there. But um, with some products, we do, um, partly because sometimes you, you, have a, you often have a trade-off uh, when you use fertilizers between yield and um, uh, and not using um, a chemical in the ground. And so if you use it in a very refined way, you can actually improve the yield um, quite substantially with some um, products like wheat, for example, you might be able to get a 30% better yield when you do use fertilizer. So in those cases, you think to yourself, well, okay, so maybe if we use it in a very sort of more precise way, we're better to use fertilizers there. So we're taking a bit of a balanced approach. It's not always um, one size fits all. Mm. But, um, but yes, organic is definitely the way forward, definitely for soil health and um, preventing pollution. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. The lady there at the end? Yeah, yeah the fr at the front. Hi. Um, so IKEA is expanding in India, and I wanted to ask how will you cater to local taste buds, um, especially given that you're famous for meatballs and the sensitivities around beef consumption in India? Yeah, that's a bit of an issue. Um, <laughs> we, we tried to enter China back in the day with cutlery. That didn't work either. So uh, we've gotten smarter with time. And uh, the way that we usually construct our range is that um, we, we divide it sort of in three layers. Uh, we have a core range, which should always be clearly identified with IKEA, Swedishness, and, or Scandinavian cuisine, if you will. And then we have... Uh, market preference, where you can adapt tastes to different regions, and then market specific, where you have, you know, specific products that would be uh, important to have in India, in this case, or in wherever it is we are. Now, of course, we cannot launch with um, the uh, the meatballs, so in India, uh, the uh, the focus will be on the on the veggie balls and the alternatives that we can uh, uh, offer uh, compared to that. So. We'll compress the, the range together with the Indian uh, organization on the range we have that would be socially acceptable and that will be commercially acceptable. And then we will have a very clear Indian uh, accent, I would say, on, on the range there as well. But we're not going to try to um, introduce meatballs just yet on the, uh, the Indian market, but try with some of the other things uh, going forward. And that's actually how we will do our expansion throughout. We are in several regions where you have preference uh, things, could be religiously motivated, Middle East and, and, and other places where we have to work with this sort of range dimensioning as we refer to. <laughs> Gentlemen here. Oh, Sorry, can I have a quick question? Um, so, thank you for the talk. Um, and uh, my question was related to, as we could see from the presentation, IKEA restaurant business quite successful. Did you think to have it as a separate entity? But because as far as I understand now, IKEA restaurants are within the shops. But um, are you thinking to do like the IKEA restaurant chain outside and then again you could have if yes then 
you can have even bigger impact yeah. on the items that you listed yeah. before. Thank you. And my question would be back, do you think it would work? I will go. Yeah? Yes. All right. <laughs> well, that's all we need. <laughs> I, um, I absolutely believe that um, no, we... Yeah. Separate the business units at that time, so I wonder if the situation had changed. Right. No, it, it's not changed. I think um, the only thing I would add to that, and uh, which maybe uh, or I think should be underlined, we believe that food um, absolutely can be the entry point to the IKEA world. I don't see a huge need for us to open a restaurant just selling food. Uh, it would always be the entry point to the IKEA world. Um, Either it would be showing you parts of the range. Uh, I guess in the future it will give you access in, in city centers in London instead of going uh, out to the areas closer to here. Uh, online abilities, but then it would make sense to have a cafe or restaurant or parts of, 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 of that as part of that offer. So as an entity by itself, no. But using food more practically in city centers closer to customers, absolutely, I think. Uh, not only do I think it will uh, come, we're actually planning it. We have concrete plans that will come. Um, and we've even tried freestanding restaurants, actually here in, in London, uh, as pop-ups uh, in, in different contexts. And they've been hugely successful. Um, so we believe actually our business model from that aspect, from just being in the stores, are changing dramatically uh, in these times and that we in the future will have to cater for both. We still believe that we will play a role in the stores, but we also believe that the stores will have an even wider offer of food. Uh, as parts of things starts going online, you will see stores, I believe, transforming into more of like experience centers. And as I said, food is a, is a great way to socialize, take time out, do your ordering, and, and you know, trying out the IKEA range even. Uh, as well. So I, I believe that we'll be much more visible in the, uh, uh, around the world in that way. Gentlemen here at the front. Thank you for your time. Um, I want to ask a question based on an answer you gave us before, which is you said people are very emotional with their food, they don't want to be lectured. Um, I just was wondering if you've thought about telling people more about um, the journey that their food has, you know, like uh, the, s the footprint or the sustainability journey at the till or perhaps at the packaging or, you know, at the fridge where they're going to acquire the product. And maybe that's a horrible business idea, but perhaps, you know, some of us more conscious would actually make a more informed choice and, and sort of absorb some of that sustainability cost, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So... I, I think it's a starting point. There's no horrible ideas. Um, I, I think um, it's, it's absolutely, uh, it's frankly a quite good idea. It is, we have to find a way of, as I said, nudging or subtly explaining uh, these things, whether it be the healthier choice, whether it be around uh, the sustainability aspects. And, and food lends itself actually quite well. Um, we can see that there is a much more easy reception for people when it comes to, to sustainability and food, as we have a much t tougher time to explain a lot of the things we're doing on the furniture side. But, but food, something you put in yourself or you put into your kids, that is very personal. Hence, people are more receptive to these kind of things. And there's many ways you can do it. You could do it on the packaging. You know, you have these trays when you come to an IKEA store. You could have inlays in those where you would uh, talk about these things. The trick for us is to find the right tone where it becomes sort of informative um, in, a, in a way that customers would, would accept. And I believe also, um, once we start really looking into this, uh, that we would have different ways of doing it in different regions. We would communicate in one way, for instance, in, in Asia. Health in, in Asia, we found, is, is very much connected to safety because of the massive food safety uh, scandals they've had. Whereas in our part, it could be more around health, uh, nutritional values and the like. So um, I think it's a great idea and we need input. Thank you. 
just uh, take a question at the front here. This is facetious. Um, I lived in Minnesota for years, and one solution to the world's obesity problem is lutefisk. <laughs> if anybody has ever, could you, maybe you could explain lutefisk. Well, well, first and foremost, I have to make a disclaimer, and that, as, as it was said earlier, um, I'm Danish, so there are certain parts of the Swedish cuisine I will not touch, um, <laughs> and. Um, I believe lutefisk is one of them. Uh, it, it's not. Um, it's not the one that is really. Oh, it's the cartridge soaked in lime. Is it? Oh. Okay, then I know which one. Yeah, that would clear all um, uh, obesity issues in the world. I think uh, once you open one of those cans, if we would open one here, I'm, I'm not kidding. You would have to leave the auditorium very, very quickly. Yeah, so um, there are parts where we could, but I think that would be a very radical strategy to take <laughs> in order to, to take our responsibility, but uh, true. On the other hand, you could say there is a lot in the Scandinavian cuisine or the New Nordic uh, Food Manifesto that actually would help in this direction, uh, looking aside from the lutefisk. Um, the Nordic cuisine is based a lot on grains, on um, uh, different uh, leaner um, fish, salmon is a big part of our, our, our menu. So there is a lot actually in the culture that we could contribute with in, uh, if we look into the new Nordic cuisine uh, as well. So it is an inspiration, loot fish or not. This question for the lady in the white top there. Thank you. Um, my question is about the IKEA diamond that you showed us. There was a, a line on it that talked about capacity development and capacity commitment. Yeah. And I wondered if you could talk a bit about what that means tangibly for IKEA and also how far back down the supply chain and how wide that, that goes. Yeah. Now, capacity uh, development and the partnership with suppliers um, builds, as I said, on long-term uh, agreements. and. Um, one of the toughest thing in retail is really to predict uh, what sort of quantities you're going to sell. Now, um, on the, uh, the furniture side, which is the best uh, reference point, I think, there are certain of our products that have been with us for many, many years, and we can, with quite high certainty, uh, predict what sort of, of capacities we would need. And what we then typically do uh, is to not only go in and do spot buys, we do that very seldomly, but we build on long term. Um, partnerships and part of that partnership is to have long-term commitments uh, with suppliers. It's not uncommon that we will sign up for several years uh, agreements with suppliers on certain capacities. Um, I think one of the beauties in IKEA is that sometimes we will not by natural means live up to our sales but we have the commitments and we will actually then push it through the system and, and that's a way of keeping a sustainable supplier base as well. Uh, if you transfer it into the, uh, the, the, the food business, where we're just, um, I guess, six months or so into building up categories and, and the same way of purchasing, it will also be one of the ways that we can grow with our suppliers. With our preferred suppliers, with our development suppliers, they need that security of certain capacities in order for them to make the investments that they need in order for us to reach the price, price points we need. We have to sell and, and pair that uh, with the quantities. If you want the low price, the quantities is uh, the, the trade-off to the suppliers. Um, gentleman over there um, in the T-shirt. Uh, thanks for the insightful talk. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on the pathway that ideas take from the Space 10 group to actually mainstream IKEA, if it's possible. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it is possible, and I think it's um, it, it's sort of a, a of a way we've worked also on the furniture side for for quite some time. It's a realization of when you have product development, uh, and we have I would say on uh, particularly on the fur uh, furniture side, but certainly also on the food side, really world class product developers that know their business inside out. But with the quantities and the volumes that we're doing, it, it takes a certain time, um, and 
and um, you need something a little more on the side where you can take greater risks, you can have a higher trial rate. Now, I think I said 50% uh, uh, just about should really be failures. Uh, otherwise, we're not testing and trying enough. So space tents and, and other units that we have, uh, we finance simply to trial, test, and to come up with ideas that we can see are scalable and that can actually move uh, IKEA forward as well. Uh, the normal uh, routine is basically that let's take vertical gardening. Uh, they've tried and tested to a large extent. As soon as we see that now we are on a level that it could become something, we start scaling it up. First, maybe in a couple of stores, and then when that works, we'll take it into maybe a country and, and so on and so forth. Um, sometimes they can work on behalf of requests we have. Sometimes they come up with stuff that no clue where that came from. And that's cool too. So um, it, that's really the, the, the process. And it, it's, worked, it's working very close, but you still have to make sure that you don't control that you let them have that sort of artistic freedom, if you will. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. Okay, time is running low now, so what I want to do is just before I thank Michael and wrap up events, I'm just going to invite Rob Clapp uh, to say a few words about uh, the LSE um, Society. Very interesting talk, but you might be thinking like what you can do um, about food waste and food poverty. So there's Food Cycle, the charity, which collects waste food. So that's food that would have been thrown out, like bruised bananas, damaged tins uh, from supermarkets, and cooks it into a three-course meal uh, for people that are at risk of food poverty. And that's happening all over London, all over the UK. Uh, you can help go along. It's a one-off commitment, so you can go see what it's like. Um, if you love it, come back. If you don't, then give us feedback. Um, you can go onto the foodcycle.org.uk website for more information. Um, and then the second thing we do is collect uh, packaged foods, so like sandwiches, salad pots from cafes in central London. Uh, so we do that every day of the week in the evenings. It's eight o'clock, so someone will be collecting right now. Uh, and then we distribute that to homeless communities outside Lincoln's infield, so literally uh, outside the building. If you're interested in that uh, kind of project, go to the LSCSU Food Cycle Society Facebook page uh, and there's more information or I'll be around at the end uh, if you want to like ask any questions. But um, yeah, come along. It's quite um, relaxed. It doesn't take long. It's 45 minutes, an hour. So it's a small change, but it can have a big impact. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so can I can I thank can I thank Michael um, for coming this evening? Um, it's been a really fascinating talk. I think these journeys that uh, a number of companies are engaging in now to address these issues of environmental and social sustainability are very very dif difficult and very very challenging. So, thank you very much, Michael, for giving me this very honest, insightful account <laughs> of your journey. want to talk to any of us we're right here we're going to stay and we're going to be the last to leave and um, thanks again for listening thank you <laughs>